Hi, Rupa. I think we can start recording. We can start 7.30. Okay, thank you very much. So welcome every day to uh, everyone to another session on um, freshwater webinars by LIFE, which is Learn Indian Freshwater Ecosystems. So this is the first of our uh, soon to be um, upload bi-monthly webinar series, which where we hope to have two around two webinars every month. And um, we just finished our quite successful World Rivers Day campaign week, where we had webinars across the week uh, on a wide range of freshwater topics. And we tried to cover as much as possible all of the major taxa and including very uh, interconnecting habitat links. And of course, the first thing that we noticed was that we did not manage to have space for riverine birds and their associated uh, habitat links. So that was the first on our priority list. And we're very happy that this has come together kind of on short notice. So thank you again to our expert speakers for um, agreeing to be on this webinar. And uh, we hope that everyone likes this format that we've tried to continue, uh, where we have three speakers that talk for about 15 minutes. So without uh, wasting any further time, uh, I'll introduce our first speaker, which is uh, Parveen. So Parveen is scientist B. She has been studying the Indian skimmer at Chambal since 2019, and the unique silver bill of the skimmer was an attractant for her to kickstart her study. And during this three years journey, she has learned so much about skimmers and other riverine birds. So yes, let's join her for this talk to know more about the nesting riverine birds of Chambal. Over to you, Parveen. Yeah, thank you, Anuja. Uh, I'll just uh, yeah, share I'll my screen. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. So yeah, uh, I'll not take much time and I'll start because I've been given 15 minutes. Uh, so yeah, the title of my talk is Skimming the Badlands of Chambal. And I'm very sure uh, people might have heard uh, more about this system and they know more about Chambal as Badlands, but there's something beautiful about this river. And uh, I'll, I'll be talking about the status of riverine nesting birds. So before I start my talk, uh, I'd like to thank my entire team who has been with me throughout this three years of project and uh, it, it wouldn't have been possible without them. So thanks a lot for everybody for their contribution. So I'll be talking about my study area first, uh, which is National Chambal Sanctuary. So River Chambal is approximately a 900 kilometers of river and it starts, uh, uh, it's originates somewhere nearby Indore and uh, it runs almost and it gets confluence uh, uh, with River Yamuna. So this uh, 600 kilometer of this river was declared as a wildlife sanctuary for protection of uh, crocodilian species known as Khayal. Uh, so if you see, uh, it is protected in two stretches. So one from the Jawasagar Dam to the Kota Barrage. And in between, the small stretch is not protected. And if you see again from Keshari Patan till the confluence with River Yamuna, it is protected again as a uh, National Chambal Sanctuary. It's a tri-state sanctuary uh, between Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh and Uttar Pradesh. So yeah, it's one of the sanctuary having three state administration, uh, which is, you know, controlling all the activities over here. So I'll be talking about the habitat. So if you see, this uh, river is one of the cleanest river uh, in the country and the water is potable. And the reason behind that it's being this clean is this river is not worship in Indian mythology. So there is no major fair or major pujas happening on this river. And it is believed that since it's a cursed river, there are crocodi crocodiles in the river and there were always deposits in this region. So if you see the habitat has, you know, really huge sandbars which are there and ravines, uh, which there are farmlands on the bank. But recently the sanctuary has been uh, very famous and in news for the illegal sand mining activity going on this river system. So if you see in this video, you will see the line of tractors which are, uh, you know, arranged for extracting, extracting sand. And this is a very common scenario if you have visited the sanctuary, uh, a very unfortunate thing. So I, I started studying uh, riverine nesting birds. So riverine nesting birds are species of birds which are found breeding across the river. Uh, but my interest was mainly birds which, uh, which nest on the sandbars or sand islands 
which emerges in between of the river during peak summer when the water level recedes. Uh, so, if you see uh, this aerial view of River Chambal in summer, so if you see this, uh, the small tiny islands which have been created. So, these are sandbars which emerges only in peak summer when the water level recedes, and these are the habitats which certain birds use for nesting. So, in River Chambal, uh, there are uh, around six to eight uh, obligatory river and nesting birds. Uh, some of them are compulsorily nesting on the sand sandbars, and some are generalist. They nest on the sandbars as well as on the bank. So, if I'll talk about the black-bellied tern, which is an endangered species, a very typically identified by having a, a very small tern having a black belly, and other species as Indian skimmer, which is vulnerable on the IUCN IUCN red list. This both are the threatened species, uh, where uh, and a good population of both the species are nesting on River Chambal. So, if you see Indian skimmer and black-bellied tern, they were widely distributed in entire Southeast Asia. But uh, at present, the species is just nesting, or uh, especially Indian skimmer is just nesting in India. Whereas black-bellied tern and both the species are distributed only in India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Uh, but India holds the maximum population of both these species. The third one is a river tern, which is again a near-threatened species found nesting on this river system. Uh, the other two near-threatened species are river lapwing and great thickney. Uh, this both species uh, do nest on the sandbars as well as on the banks, so they are not compulsorily nesting on the sandbars only. And the again, the last one is a little tern. It's again a breeding migrant over here. It doesn't stay here throughout the year. The Indian skimmer and little tern both are the breeding migrants. The rest of them are resident species, and they spend the throughout the uh, like throughout the year they are found on the river chambal. So. Uh, if you see, uh, these birds are actually on ground they nest, and they don't make their nest as very typically. So it's basically, if you see in this image, there's an Indian skimmer incubating eggs in the nest. So they just dig out a small cavity on the sandbars and they lay their eggs. Uh, river terns usually uh, bring some nesting materials, uh, like they collect some pebbles and uh, some sticks, but uh, little tern, uh, black belly tern, and Indian skimmers, they just scrape out the sand and they make nests. So I'll just run a small video to show how these birds are actually nesting on the sandbar. Uh, this is a video of an Indian skimmer. Uh, so I'm, I'm talking about all river and birds, but my focus of the study was, uh, was uh, one of the species known as Indian skimmer in this landscape. So if you see over here, uh, there's an egg and a chick hatched out in the nest and parents attending the nest. So if you see the belly, uh, they have wet it with water. So this is how incubation is done uh, in this sand bar nesting birds because it's really hot and they want to um, they want to protect the chicks and the eggs from high temperature. So this is how one parent will uh, wet their belly, come and sit on the nest, and then other parent will go and uh, wet the belly feathers. And again, so they keep on taking the turn, and this is how they they incubate and they take care of the chicks in this hot temperature. So we actually uh, surveyed the entire approximately 400 kilometer stretch of the river for two to three years. And we located where all these birds are nesting. So we almost found 30 locations uh, where all these river and nesting uh, river and nesting birds were having nesting colonies. If you see certain of the colonies, on the, uh, they were used on consecutive years. So we wanted to know whether it is a very strong site fidelity in the birds where they tend to come at the same nesting places every year repeatedly, or it is because a dynamic system where these islands are consecutively formed at the same place. Because uh, every year this river gets flooded and every year when the water resides, these islands emerge. So it's a very dynamic system and things keep on changing every year. So if uh, so, I'll give an example of Indian skimmer and what exactly is happening in the sanctuary. So these birds are breeding migrant over here. So they do start coming by November and December and they all uh, colonized during the Feb. So you will see that there's a, this is a courtship behavior where male is doing a head bobbing and then they mate and then they make nest cavity and then they lay eggs. So this entire process is almost 20, 25 days. If you see, then they, they again, when they incubate the eggs, the hatching takes place almost again 20 to 25 days, which is the period between the egg laying and hatching period. And once the chicks have hatched out, you see that they're very camouflaged as sand. And later on, the entire process for the chicks to fly after hatching is again a 20 to 25 days period. 
So it's a very time consuming and a very energy inclusive process for both the parents. So what happened during this entire process, not only in Indian skimmers, but black belly turn, little turn and river lapping, that between the egg laying and the hatching period, there's a lot of threats that these birds have to face. And there's a maximum loss which is happening over here. And again, once the chicks are hatched out, there's an again uh, added on loss which is happening till the, the, till the chicks fledge out from the nesting side. So what we estimated for Indian skimmer, the nesting success was only 14%. So, and this is after laying two clutches of eggs, so which was a very low nesting success for the species. So we are trying to understand like why, why this much of loss is happening. So what happened that after the egg laying and before the hatching period, since the time period is quite, quite uh, big, 20 to 25 days of incubation, when the birds start nesting, actually the islands are quite isolated. But as soon as the summer peaks up and the water level keeps on decreasing, these islands get connected to the bank and this is where all the threats come in the picture. Free-ranging dogs are the biggest problem in the sanctuary for all the riverine nesting birds. So if you see this island, like, uh, you know, we had visited this island and there were uh, almost 20 nests of skimmers and other birds. And in, in a period of five minutes, a, a group of dogs just, uh, you know, they predated everything. So this is a picture of a dog uh, predating on not only on eggs, but also as chicks. That's the reason that the fledging success is also low. The second major problem is uh, cattle trampling, as this region have a lot of uh, livestock and uh, most of these cattle spend their summers on the river and, uh, in the, and when they are on the river, they tend to cross this islands and this is how when they trample chicks, this is a little turn chick which was trampled on the island. Uh, there's an, as I mentioned, there's a lot of illegal sand mining and this mining actually, you know, they hamper the nesting habitat, many places or their sand the entire sandbar was actually taken by the sand mining people. So this is how the site get the birds have to abandon the complete site and they have to find another nesting place. So if they don't have enough time for laying the second clutch, uh, they will they will just uh, you know wander around for some time before the river gets flooded and they move to another place. So uh, as I uh, so apart from the threat, uh, so the interesting thing that we studied that some of the species don't spend uh, throughout, they don't be uh, throughout the year. So we wanted to know where do they go? Because if you want to do conservation of a species, it shouldn't be that we are just focusing on the breeding sites and we don't know where do they spend their non-breeding sites. So we started uh, with a bird ringing and color flagging study in 2019 and we trapped them uh, by, by nets at night and we put up a color flag on them. Uh, which is a white color uh, flag uh, with, a, with a red color number inscribed on it. And we even mark certain fledglings to see whether it's, uh, where do these birds go and do they come back to the same nesting sites? And it's only adults which come back on the nesting site or else even chicks come to their same nesting uh, where they were born and they nest at the same place. So we started marking the birds to check more about the migration. It was quite interesting that when we, these were the all places that we marked the birds on River Chumbal, and it was interesting that we got reciting records, um, maximum reciting records coming from Gujarat. And that also had two places, Jamnagar and Porbandar. Uh, so that's that uh, the population nesting on River Chambal is uh, probably moving to the West Coast during the non-breeding season. And uh, it was quite interesting that one of the reciting came from all the way from, uh, all, all the way from Kakinara and Andhra Pradesh. So that's a quite a good aerial distance that the birds travel during the non-breeding season. Uh, even last year, we got some bee sightings coming from on uh, from the river Ganga. So, and uh, the same birds we later on recited on on the river Chambal. So, we believe that they probably go to the west coast, and while returning, they use river system and they enter river Chambal through river Yamuna. So, that is that is just a hypothesis. We haven't concluded anything about it by the time we don't satellite type few birds. I think so. It will be difficult to say what routes they use, but this is. A, Looking at the time frame when we recited and when the birds came back to Chambal, we are just assuming that they use uh, different river systems to go to the non-breeding sites and come to the breeding sites again. So uh, I will just run this small video of showing that uh, there's a marked bird, uh, marked bird in this video. Uh, so if you see, there's a there's a small tag on the leg which says a number. Uh, this bird was marked in 2018 and it came back in 2019 and nested at the same place where it was marked and raised three chicks uh, successfully.
this indicated uh, that birds, these birds do have a very strong site fidelity to their nesting site. And it is very important to conserve this uh, area because since a, a really large population of this riverine birds, especially the threatened riverine birds are nesting at this place. So yeah, I would uh, like to end my presentation um, on, on this uh, video. And because since, uh, you know, it, it ends up on a very positive thing that the birds do tend to come here and, you know, how they are facing a lot of threats, but uh, they have a site fidelity and it needs to be conserved. So I would just like to acknowledge uh, all my all my donors and the Forest Department of uh, Madhya Pradesh as well as Uttar Pradesh for supporting this entire work. So over to you, Anuja, and I, I just hope that I have I've kept it in time. No, no, no hard and fast rule, but yeah. thank you so much for keeping it really short and brief. Yeah. brief. And it was really interesting that you um, straight off the bat showed us, you know, those visuals of sand mining, which a lot of researchers, you know, kind of just want to downplay, especially in a place like Chambal, where it, yeah. it is really more of a, a structural systemic problem. Yes. But, uh, so I just had a quick thought. I mean, there are already questions coming in. Take okay. them towards the end. Yeah. Um, but I think we'll we'll preferably do that again. My internet's also unstable, so let's move on to uh, Dr. Subramanian. Yes, he uh, is currently scientist E and officer in charge of the Southern Regional Center. Sarasai. Yeah, thanks, Parveen. Yes, and uh, he is really a stalwart in the field of freshwater. Uh, he specializes in freshwater biodiversity conservation and aquatic insects, geographic information system GIS, and biodiversity databases and macro photography. So uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Subhu, if you're there. And yes, uh, waiting to hear from you. Uh, a complete shift from riverine birds now to the world of benthic bugs and macroinvertebrates. So go ahead, sir. Once again, uh, okay, I think so. I have to stop my yes, screen sharing. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, I don't. Visible? Hello, is it visible? Yes. yes. Hello. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, thank, you very, uh, thank you very much, yeah. Anuja and Baba Puma for giving me an opportunity to interact with you. So, my job is to connect Parveen uh, and the entire ecosystem. So, let me start with uh, some uh, basics so that we can move on. So, as you all know, we have very, very little fresh water in the whole earth. That is only about 0.3% of all the water facilities. 0.3% that is lakes and rivers. And in this lakes and rivers, only what all the biodiversity or about all the freshwater biodiversity we have, we talk about, we're trying to consider. So, if you look at the uh, freshwater uh, fauna, I'm just focusing on fauna. I'm not going to talk about but just going to talk about the shorter fauna of India, we see that nearly about uh, 9,000 odd number of species are so far recorded from all the groups, from protozoa to mammals. And if you look at the more uh, charismatic and well-known species like birds, we have only about 243 species, and most of which are migratory. And and bulk of the species are what we call it as uh, uh, macro invertebrates. So these are the large invertebrates which can be seen or which can be studied without any aid of microscopes. So you can see them. And in this, about nearly 5,000 species. So this number keeps fluctuating because new species are regularly being discovered. So nearly 50% of India uh, shorter fauna is in this case. And this is what all the other organisms feed and so if you look at the uh, freshwater biogeography of India, you, you can see that there are about the major 20 uh, freshwater biodiversity regions. This is largely based on the kind of uh, fauna they have and the kind of geomorphology they have. So mostly the Western Ghats and Eastern Himalaya of freshwater ecosystems are high diversity of organisms, especially of fishes and other. Vertebrates, but the biodiversity of uh, like Western Himalaya or Central Indian freshwater ecosystems are relatively less, but they have very interesting species. But high endemism and 
a large number of species are found in western Ghats streams and rivers again again in eastern himalaya stream and generally the more diversity and more diversity of species and also more diversity of the different groups is seen in uh, rivers and streams than what when you compare it with lakes and reservoirs or so we have like different kind of uh, river and ecosystems like parvin showed about jambal system so this is uh, high altitude rivers of himalaya that is trans himalayan rivers we have very fast flowing and um, himalayan rivers and uh, of course you have different waterfalls this is just to show you different kind of flood types then you have streams and cascades and you have of course the uh, man made uh, wetland ecosystems like paddy fields then again you have interesting systems like lakes this is the uh, kebul lamjo lake from manipur you have these kind of systems so these are the major kind of uh, habitats where you can see a uh, macro invertebrates and <coughs> so what are a uh, macro invertebrates as already told you they are the large uh, invertebrates which can be seen by by naked eye and which can be collected and there are groups like for example mollusks we have freshwater mollusks we have about more than 200 species of uh, freshwater mollusks and above that is about like globally we have 5000 species and of this about 70 species 77 species are endemic to western india so i will come back to this little later how these are connected in birds then you have other major groups like arthropods that is crustaceans that is uh, crabs lobsters crayfishes and shrimps and about 800 more than 800 species are reported in indian waters these crabs and these are freshwater i'm saying and just more than 800 species are recorded and comes uh, like you may think that um, you like mostly when we talk about arachnids that is spiders and so there are uh, spiders aquatic spiders and there are aquatic mites these are very small group but very uh, interesting groups then comes the major uh, group that is aquatic insects so more than i already told you nearly 5000 species of aquatic insects are there so i'm not going to the details of different aquatic insects i just wanted to show you the some uh, important aquatic insects so that you get an idea of it. and most of these aquatic insects you can say that either their larval stages are in water or there some like aquatic beetles or aquatic bugs their adults are also in the water but several groups like may flies dragon flies and stone flies some like so uh, caddis flies all those are dipterans flies all those species have their larva in the water and adults as in the, in the neighboring riparian zone or river and ecosystems they use the ecosystems so this is the uh, ephemeroptera may flies so this is nearly about 174 species are found in india so the adults are uh, terrestrial and they live very short durations so they live for uh, one or two days they are non feeding So their major part is uh, in the water as uh, like larva that is may fly larva so you can see them in streams mostly the high diversity is in streams and rivers then you have the stone flies so again stone flies the larva is aquatic and adults are terrestrial mostly found in uh, river and ecosystem sorry mostly found in riparian zone and high diversity is found in uh, himalayan region mostly the streams because they require very cold waters and this is the larva of uh, the stone fly and comes the uh, dragon flies and damsel flies this is uh, relatively well studied animals are very well studied animals are terrestrial and they are found very closely associated with other i'm not going to talk about dragon flies and damsel flies and this is the larval stages of uh, dragon flies and damsel flies found in streams uh, almost all kind of wetlands then comes the very common aquatic bugs so there are several species more than uh, 300 species are there in india and you can see them in different families and different shapes you, the common ones are like water striders or water scorpions or water boatmans which we all know these are the different uh, types of 
is a species of very common species of aquatic bugs then comes the aquatic beetle these are a different kind of water beetles we have whirligig beetles we have big uh, water beetles which are highly predaceous so some of them are very interesting because they have a very unique morphology like this whirligig beetles which always on the water surface they have uh, two pairs of eyes so they have essentially four eyes so two to see below the water and two to see above the water simultaneously so they are very interesting visual systems so they can simultaneously see the predators coming from above the water and below the water then you have this uh, diptera these are flies very common and they are very important in terms of uh, this is medical and veterinary important so i will again come back to this group later little later talk about how these are, are connected with birds in this are the diptera and larva i already told you most of the diptera and larva are aquatic and you have uh, like there are and adults are terrestrial close by then comes the trichoptera or the caddis flies again the larva is aquatic and adults are terrestrial they are also very highly diverse more than 1300 species are recorded in india mostly in hill streams so this is how we uh, sample aquatic insects in rivers and streams so you have we have used the different types of nets to collect aquatic uh, hill stream insects and insects in the water so this is one type of method called quick net sampling then you can also use uh, by, by there are t frame nets and you can use by hand picking in very shallow streams so most of them are small microscopic and you also use light traps to collect uh, adult insects so these are the ways we study them so how and why uh, these insects aquatic insects or aquatic macroinvertebrates are very important in the river and ecosystem there is a very well known uh, concept called the river ecology called the river continuum concept and this is very well tested across all systems whether it is tropical or temperate ecosystem when the river starts, and you know, you may be aware of the uh, different uh, parts of the river. So, what we call it as the first order strip. So, when the river originates, so most of the organic input what we get in the river is from the neighboring uh, surrounding landscapes. So, that is, uh, so, the most of the organic input that comes to the river is from the surrounding land landscape, and the sunlight is really less in these ecosystems because of the uh, canopy cover. Due to this, what happens is that most of the uh, primary productivity is very less in this ecosystem and the organic matter that is coming into this system in the uh, headwaters is more largely processed by the macroinvertebrates so there are different uh, feeding gills in the aquatic macroinvertebrate they are called shredders they are grazers and they are collectors and these are based on they are classified based on the, the way a kind of mouth parts they have the kind of feeding mechanisms they have. so they what they do is that they break up this organic matter into tiny and smaller pieces and that is that entire organic matter is made to released in the system so where, where those systems are further are broken down into uh, finer organic matter by action of the bacteria and fungus and that is further that is how this uh, nutrient enrichment in the river ecosystem happens so here the Macroinvertebrate plays two roles. One is to uh, degrade the organic matter into usable form of releasing of energy. Another is that they are the prey for most of the large uh, vertebrates, that is, the uh, fishes or even, even like even other uh, aquatic birds. Like, for example, you might have seen uh, it's very common in uh, Himalayan rivers. I mean, there are several bird species that is restricted to streams like for example four tails how the river starts so we have the uh, dippers so they all depend on these aquatic invertebrates especially the uh, stone flies as from stone flies may flies and other uh, other uh, hill stream insects which they feed the larval stages are the major source of food for these insects and at the uh, down, downstream that is when the river becomes more like as, as you as you may be aware the river uh, river in the initial stages is an erosional system so because it eroded the uh, geomorphology 
and when it becomes downstream when it reaches the plains it big starts meandering and it becomes more of a depositional nature so during that time the the entire aquatic macroinvertebrate community also changes so when the river system becomes a meandering kind of system and you can see lot of plus crabs large crustaceans you can see that forms a major source of food for large uh, fishes and also birds and other even uh, aquatic mammals like the uh, of the crabs like one of the favorite food of otters of crabs so this is another representation of the same uh, food chain what i was explaining to you later so how the macroinvertebrates forms the uh, linkage between the zooplankton and the large fishes so they consume the zooplankton and or they degrade the organic matter and they form the major prey to the fishes and further down the um, birds so so this is a common um, like wetland birds so you guys would have seen this this is from my ncf poster so you can see all these uh, birds all these wetland birds are very common in urban areas and most of them like they form a major the aquatic macroinvertebrates are a major source of food say for example this asian open bill stork they are specialized in feeding on uh, mollusca like uh, gastropods so you might have seen the video also how like they are big though they though it appears a very bulky structure if you see how beautifully it can take out the soft part of mollusca without damaging the shell so they are very expert in that you can see how beautifully it will nicely take out the uh, the soft part of the gastropods and like and in fact they can uh, feed the um, gastropods even taking even taking the gastropod out of the pot so they are very expert in that so several like for example our wagtails uh, or even the uh, sandpipers or the plovers they all feed on annelids they are again they are macroinvertebrates or even and several uh, like several what do you call primarily omnivorous birds like feed on macroinvertebrates especially during breeding season and uh, to have an additional uh, nutrition say for example the mollusca forms the one of the major source of calcium for all these for these uh, birds and and very important for their uh, reproductive success because of the thickness of the eggshell of the formation of the bone everything depends on the uh, availability of good amount of calcium so i will come back to this little later and like again there is a large congregation of several species especially when there is a high biomass and density macroinvertebrates this is from chilka lake again uh, again uh, again in chilka lake you can see large congregation of birds and urban wetlands also like this is very common in like even in cities like chennai or mumbai you can see there are birds con huge and especially endangered birds congregating in some plants and these are all because of wherever there is a good density and availability of food you can see that there is a good population of this and before going to human footprint i just want to tell you about how already told about how these birds and vertebrates are linked in other way also so several of these macroinvertebrates especially mollusca even in dragonfly larva are intermediate host for several parasites of birds several cestode parasites or nematode parasites of birds so these are the intermediate host of birds and the and actually the the macroinvertebrates when the birds consume the macroinvertebrate this host the parasite enters the host and the complete the life cycle so and when the birds move from one place to another this parasite is also transmitted and carried so that is one aspect another aspect is that the one of the major uh, reasons for natural reasons for bird mortality is bird malaria like human beings birds also have malaria it's the same a genus of parasite that is called plasmodium so birds also have plasmodium parasite and in fact the bird parrot plasmodium is used as a control system to study plasmodium infections and the, the wild mosquitoes there are mosquito species which is like say for example there are more than 330 species of mosquitoes in india in india alone and of this only about 10 to 12 species of mosquito bite human beings and of this 10 to 12 species of mosquitoes only 
a handful, maybe five, six species are major uh, vectors of human diseases. So all others are like all other you can see, then you can imagine more than 310 species of uh, 20 species of mosquitoes. What they feed on? They feed on birds, birds and other vertebrates, including cattle and even reptiles, they do feed on these wild mosquitoes also. And these bird, bird feeding uh, mosquitoes transmit diseases. They, they transmit uh, uh, a disease like even malaria, which causes a major mortality to these birds. So that is how they are involved. But uh, what is happening to our wetlands, especially in the Rhine ecosystems, as uh, always already indicated you what is happening to the human system. So it's largely because of human. And dams and hydroelectric projects are one of the major causes of a decline of uh, freshwater microinvertebrates because they change the entire hydrology of the system. So river is a the, the hydrology of river and ecosystems are entirely different from the um, other wetland ecosystems. So they change the hydrology and, and entirely change the communities of the ecosystem. Then are uh, domestic sewage and pollution. So you know, the entire city. The drainage system is like river is like drainage. So this is very true for other urban areas like Chennai also. It's very true. So this is how the entire river banks are converted into concrete structures. So it's more like a canal. So this is very common in India. Then you have uh, like disposal of garbage in wetlands, especially streams. So this is a very common practice in tourist areas and especially in heat tourism. Then you have this unregulated. Uh, Infrastructure developments, in especially in streams or weathering uh, of hill streams, the entire landslide or uh, overburden of this uh, infrastructure development ends up in rivers and streams. Then, yeah, of course, you have this uh, mining in several places like open uh, dust mining, which causes serious damage. And you have agricultural runoff. So, agricultural runoff carry, carries uh, several pesticides and you have pollution, it changes the hydrochemistry of the system and also uh, kills the several of these macro -invertebrates because several of these pesticides are also harmful to the aquatic insects and aquatic macro -invertebrates. And new generation pesticides are like you have this new generation pesticide like a, a juvenile hormone analogs or growth regulators, which create a havoc in the system, in the ecosystem, in the rivers and streams. So, if you look at the condition of the biodiversity condition of the river and ecosystem across the world, this is a perfect result. You can see that most of the rivers and streams in the Indian subcontinent and other parts of developing areas are also seriously threatened, largely because of uh, human interference and it's identified also agriculture runoff, pollution, or UAC species. These are all. Threatened more than, like it is estimated that more than 65% of biodiversity in the ecosystem seriously. And a recent, this is this IPBS <coughs> assessment of uh, different ecosystems, and they have identified the, uh, the, the drivers for the systems. It is largely due, due to our consumption patterns and our uh, resource energy requirement and all that, which causes the like uh, decline of uh, biodiversity in all the ecosystem, whether it is terrestrial, freshwater, or marine ecosystem, which has direct impact and which has reduces the uh, availability of ecosystem services, like both the provisioning services, or regulating services, or supporting services, or including conservation services. This has a direct impact. And with this, I stop and I think we can discuss the. Later, as Anujana has already talked, we can stop here and we can continue. Uh, Subhu, thank you very much. This is Gopal Kumar. I think Anuja's uh, mic is, uh, is still off. So, uh, Thank you very much for that, and and that was really marvelous. I mean, I, I just find out found that 
just so interesting and so uh, full of information. In fact, I was just thinking as you were speaking that I need to go back on YouTube and see it once more to digest all of it. Right? So, yeah. thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Hope I finished in time. Yeah. Yes, it's just about. Over to Anuja. I'm just. Yeah. Hi, Gopal. Yeah, my internet. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Yeah. Hi, Subhu, sir. That was really a very holistic uh, talk. Thank you. I think we would need Thank you. A, probably a full session if we need to hear you talk more in detail about molecules or mayflies or such. Um, and it was really interesting to also hear you talk about how mosquitoes, there are so many species and they feed on birds. Whereas usually when we look at the food chain, it's always, you know, we focus more on vertebrates and them feeding on invertebrates. So Really, thank you for those interesting facts and snippets that you have. Yeah, actually, me. like just for information. So, really, thank actually, you so much for a wonderful talk. Yeah, yeah. Uh, moving yeah, yeah. on. No, no, I don't. Like, actually, uh, like uh, this, uh, even the oh, yeah. human introduced mosquitoes were one of the major reasons for extinction of several Hawaii and honey creepers. So, so this, uh, when uh, people went, so oh. they, they also carried a lot of the, the ship, they also carried a lot of. Uh, Lot of mosquitoes and this and this and uh, this uh, Hawaiian honey creepers were um, they were not exposed to this avian malaria. So these birds, uh, when they human went there, and this avian malaria okay. infected them. And several species of Hawaiian honey creepers went extinct. Because of so the mosquitoes are very important in birds. Okay, interesting. I'm sure. Yeah, there are very few people also working on issues of avian malaria in India. So yeah, yeah, this yeah. is a field that anyway needs to be explored a lot more. So thank you. Yeah. So moving on to uh, Ankita. Ankita, uh, hope you're around. Ankita Sinha is a PhD candidate at the Wildlife Institute of India. And uh, she is fascinated by temperate river systems and has worked in the Western Himalayas. She's interested in birds of all colors and songs and has traveled in search of them across many Himalayan states. She likes to read and write about them whenever she finds time between writing grants and scientific articles. Don't we all? So, uh, Ankita, over to you if you can um, yeah, start sharing a screen as well. Yeah. Thank you, Anuja, for the introduction. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yes, you are. Is the screen visible? Yes, it is, Ankita. Please carry on. Um, taking a second. Yeah. yeah. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, Anuja has already given my introduction, and uh, today I'll be talking about uh, river birds and some threats to their conservation. So. Uh, as the previous speakers, they mostly spoke about uh, the Indian uh, scenario. I'll be speaking a little uh, bit of a different uh, scenario. But when we talk about rivers and organisms uh, living in them, there are a lot of different uh, taxa who live in, in the water channel, in the ripe area, along the river, starting from plants, which uh, live only along uh, flowing waters, to macroinvertebrates about which uh, my previous speaker gave amazing uh, insights about to river dolphins, otters, beavers, multitudes of amphibian species, and uh, some fishes which only live in uh, freshwaters like the mahashir, and a lot of uh, unique reptiles. But when it comes to birds, about which uh, the first speaker, our first speaker, Parveen, uh, talked about in a lot of uh, details. Birds somehow, you know, they lose the, probably because they're not fully aquatic and they just use the ripe area and birds are otherwise considered as uh, terrestrial animals. Uh, especially when we talk about birds, we think about forests and birds in them or things like that. So birds are not really much associated with the ripe area systems, but across the world, there are some unique species which have adapted to live along uh, ripe areas systems 
And here, when I talk about uh, river birds, I mean birds which occur along streams or rivers during a significant part of their breeding and non-breeding uh, or non-breeding life cycle, and feed their their food is uh, dependent on the aquatic or the riparian uh, resource. So, saying that 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 is how we are classifying birds as river birds. There are 66 as, such species all across the world, spread across 19 families. And uh, these terms are common for birders. There are some 37 non passerines where birds are spread across different groups like gulls, terns, herons, kingfishers, and also two unique owls which live exclusively along flowing waters. Uh, the pell eagle owl and uh, the black and stern's eagle owl and these are very wonderful birds which uh, live along fast flowing streams and they hunt directly from the flowing streams feed on fishes and sometimes also large insects tadpoles etc they are wonderful birds so when you look at this different uh, families there you see there are a lot of uh, different song birds also which have adapted to live exclusively uh, along flowing water systems and they're very unique in their ecology because you we usually see songbirds and if you've noticed all these birds bird pictures that you see here they are very dull looking birds not the fancy colorful birds that we see in forests with elaborate songs although birds which uh, live along fast flowing river streams have very elaborate songs very high pitched because they have to uh, cope up with the torrential stream sound that they the background that they live in but uh, yeah, so they're not really very colorful, unlike their forest uh, cousins, you know. And when you look at uh, the distribution of these specialist river birds all across the world, there's a very, very interesting pattern. We see that India has quite a lot of specialist river birds, birds which have specialized to live in rivers, along rivers. And the Himalaya has the highest number of river birds all across the world with the border of Myanmar, China, and India having the richest uh, river bird community across the world. And uh, we have 15 species which overlap in their geographic ranges in this particular part of the world. If you look closely, this is what the Himalayan river bird assemblage looks like. There are a lot of, uh, on the left, there are a lot of small bodied birds. Uh, I'm, I guess there are a lot of people here who know about birds but there might be some who are not birders so on the left hand side uh, these are all songbirds uh, red studs wagtails brown dippers dippers are the most studied river birds of the world the white capped uh, sorry the white throated dipper is the only one which shares its range between asia europe and parts of northern africa but it's the most uh, widely distributed river bird and has been studied thoroughly by uh, a lot of people, including my uh, own PhD supervisor. And on the right, you have bigger body size birds, river lappings, uh, the second largest heron of the world, the white bellied heron is a specialist river bird. And we also have part of its range in India, terns, skimmers, Skimmers are not found uh, in the Himalaya, but yeah, they're found in India. But river terns have some, a little bit of range in towards Arunachal Pradesh. And we have someone who's called the wonder bird of the Himalaya, that is the ibis bill on the topmost right corner of the screen with a large uh, elongated sh uh, sharp red bill. I'll talk about this bird more in detail. It's very fascinating to birders. Uh, we get overjoyed to get a glimpse of it. And what is unique to the riverine system in Indian uh, Himalaya is that we have one group which is unique across the entire world. And these are the forktails. We have five species of forktails, which is found here. And here on the screen, you can see seven of them. This is the forktail family that is, there are seven species in this family, but five are found. The last two are island species. They're not found uh, in India also. Uh, but this is one group which is unique uh, to Asia. It's not found anywhere all across the world. And uh, 
if we go back to that map uh, here we see that you know this particular dark region which has more than 15 species is practically a lot of the contribution to these river bird richness here is by these species of foxtails which are unique to this part of the world so i studied river birds for my phd uh, i am a phd student at the wildlife institute of india and i studied patterns of distribution of river birds in the western himalaya and i did field surveys uh, between uh, river stretches uh, between gangotri and rishikesh uh, covering a large uh, elevational gradient uh, rishikesh is something around 300 meters above sea level and gangotri at around 31 to 32 meters above sea level and all along this river this river is called uh, bhagirathi popularly it's one of the major headwaters of uh, the ganges so at dev prayag which you see on the map it joins another major river the alaknanda uh, and hence it's called the ganges after this confluence it's called the ganges my study was across these major settlements of rishikesh te prayag new to new tehri uttar kashi harshil which is a small army cantonment area and gangotri so i'll walk you through a little through my research findings uh, so these were the river birds that i recorded during uh, the field survey and some of them were breeding here some of them were visiting only seasonally and some of them were found in the foothills where some of them were found high up in the mountains they they were breeding high up in the mountains these are how the study sites look like uh, on the top left corner that's gangotri and you move through the apple orchards of if you move clockwise uh, the apple or orchards of uh, harshil and the village of bogori this is where i first came across that wonder bird um, ibis bill ibis bills are fantastic creatures uh, if you can see these river beds they look uh, very different they are called shingle river beds and with that curved beak ibis bills probe beneath every rock to pick up macro invertebrates about which uh, my previous speaker spoke in details so they are very unique they are only found uh, across uh, cent some central asian uh, upland river systems and these flat river beds which are made of shingle they are very very unique and very rare and elusive that is why they are called uh, wonder birds of the himalaya and people uh, birders are crazy to get a glimpse of that bird the most interesting part about that bird is they are found exclusively uh, in pristine river beds undisturbed and then when we descend down we come to uttarkashi and new tihri places which are a little bit disturbed because human settlement starts increasing on the left hand side this is a river stretch in uttarkashi you can see a lot of eroding slopes this is because of the gangotri highway which is being built which is very much functional all across the year but uh, the activity starts peaking after april and on the on the on the right hand side uh, sorry that that's the left picture on the right hand side uh, is tihri dam those are the backwaters of the tihri dam so here the river is not free flowing anymore tihri dam is one of the biggest uh, dams in asia i'll talk about dams later in in this presentation and when we descend a little more down we come to dev prayag and rishikesh when the river reaches rishikesh it's finally joining the valley it broadens up and finally comes into the clutch of uh, human civilization where you see the banks have already been paved i'm walking you through these different habitat types because in my next slides i'll be talking about how different birds use different habitats river stretches and river banks for their survival so what does this river habitat mean to a particular river bird so as parveen had pointed out about sandbars she was talking about rivers uh, in plains here in upland river systems we have foraging perches and resting places for birds in the form of uh, exposed bedrock and the vegetation all along the river bank is used by birds for nesting hiding from predators roosting when they are not finding for food also they provide them shade the riparian vegetation provides the very very crucial uh, allochthonous input into the river 
which goes into the food web and takes care of the entire stream food web system. The trees along rivers provide crucial foraging pouches for a lot of birds like kingfishers. And the water channel is the most important component of the habitat template for river birds because it provides food in the form of fishes, macroinvertebrates, crustacea, submerged vegetation, and also often terrestrial insects, which form a film along these uh, what the water film along uh, along the river, yeah. And having looking at this uh, at this uh, illustration, we can now uh, try and understand which birds use what kind of habitats. So breeding habitats for different birds are different. There are some birds in the Himalayan system who visit only to breed here. They come sometimes come from different countries or different parts of our own country but they only breed along high elevation shingle riverbeds. And then in winters, they move down to other habitats, often grasslands, fields, even cities. So the birds that I'm showing here are common sandpipers, ibis bill, white wagtail, and gray wagtail. While ibis bill is an obligate riverine bird, which spends all its life along the river and on the same kind of riverbeds, common sandpipers, white wagtail, and gray wagtails are non obligate river birds, they visit very seasonally only during summers to breed along high altitude river systems. The ecology of these same birds across Europe are very different. They breed along streams essentially, but they are not obligate river birds. <clears throat> but in the Himalayas, they are very much attached to the upland river systems for their breeding. Coming to the next set of birds, Plumbious water red stars, blue whistling thrush, brown dipper, and the forktails. We find two species of forktails in Western Himalaya, spotted forktail and little forktail. They prefer a very uh, different mosaic of habitat. They essentially need exposed bedrock with fast flowing cascades and well vegetated river banks. So the common thing about all these species that I show on this uh, particular slide is that they are all, all of their nests almost look similar. The, the nesting material is very similar. It's made with moss and dried leaves. And if you look very carefully, there are these crevices, there are these uh, rock cups that are formed naturally by these boulders. This is where these are the sites where these birds nest. Especially these two forktails, they you'll not find forktails where there is no vegetation along the banks. Riparian vegetation is a very, very important thing for all these birds to nest. They always prefer to nest along river banks, which have good vegetation on both its banks. So having understood uh, where these birds nest, we always know that bird will nest somewhere where they have enough food for their next generation, for their chicks, their fledglings. So yeah, on the first, uh, on the left hand side uh, top panel, that's Anuja and me and my field assistants and other uh, um, friends who helped me collect macroinvertebrates. So these birds feed on macroinvertebrates and we tried looking at how the macroinvertebrate composition is changing across different river stretches. So what we did is, yeah, so as uh, my previous speaker pointed out, there are different methods to collect macroinvertebrates in river streams. So in some places we tried hand picking and in some places, we did uh, kick net sampling, uh, standard three minute kick net sampling. And then we looked through the macroinvertebrates. And based on previous studies published by uh, my co supervisor years back in uh, 1998, there's a key available from Nepal from which uh, I matched some of the invertebrates, as in to which birds eat which of the macroinvertebrates. And these were the main, uh, these are the main diet spectra for these birds. Although brown dippers consume some amount of fish, especially during their breeding season when their dietary requirements are very high because uh, the, they usually raise two clutches, at least in Western Himalaya, they raise two clutches and uh, it's a very demanding time for them. They dive a lot more during that time. Uh, they're wonderful birds, beautiful birds. They go sometimes go very deep into the water to catch fish and they keep beating the fish on the rock until it uh, dies and then goes and gives it to the young ones until the young ones are ready almost in three to four weeks time when they start hunting on their own. So basically mayflies, caddisflies, stoneflies, some water beetles 
and some flies especially for birds like plumbus water red star they sit on uh, these exposed bedrock and they fly from there to catch the prey from the air for them these flies are very important occasionally they would devour a butterfly or a dragonfly larvae or a small damsel fly too but the major diet spectra of himalayan river birds encompasses of these uh, macro invertebrates and sometimes small fish although when we uh, talk about kingfishers which are found a little lower uh, in elevation uh, beyond the prayag and rishikesh beyond 400 meters we see the diet spectra of birds changing it's it becomes majorly uh, the birds become majorly dependent on fishes tadpoles and a lot of times submerged vegetation so talking about uh, the entire uh, way how birds live in these habitats uh, it's very uh, unfortunate that you know we uh, we coexist with these birds too and human needs and uh, their dependence on rivers have only increased since civilization we've uh, discovered innovative ways to exploit rivers every other day and in the himalayan system the major exploitation happens in the form of hydroelectric power generation and uh, that's the maneri dam that you can see but uh, there for a bird the the modification of the river happens in multiple other ways and major among them is the flow getting uh, modified when you we build barricades along the rivers in form of small weirs sometimes in the form of uh, flood control gates and also land use change on the ripe area on the bank of the river where people use it for agriculture they remove the native ripe area and vegetation they build houses uh, you build the the land is converted into agricultural land and when you come lower down much lower down to proper human uh, large settlements like rishikesh which is a very big uh, tourist hot spot you see the river banks are paved but uh, the birds need perching sites and the bird uh, every bird's ecology is very different a wagtail can perch on this paved bank but a forktail cannot feed from this perched bank or even a kingfisher it cannot perch on this paved bank and this doesn't stop here in the western himalaya there we have uh, this big pilgrimage circuit of the char dham uh, i was working on the gangotri uh, char dham route i visited other char dham routes and this is a yearly event it starts uh, around end of april and goes on until diwali october and you have It, it's a havoc the river beds are full of people there are multiple things happening all along the river bank along different stretches and the most unfortunate thing is this coincides with the breeding time of most of the birds of the himalayan uh, of the western himalaya at least and it's 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 a very dicey thing because uh, humans are trying to raise money people in the uh, in the mountains are trying to raise money for the rest of their uh, year when it will be a lull period for them they'll not be earning much and the birds are trying their best to give their chicks the best diet so that they can uh, get the best out of uh, their clutch so it's a competition and honestly uh, not much has been documented yet my work was more on the ecology part but these are only things which i documented when i was doing my uh, scientific uh, project but these things really need to be quantified so that we actually know how much threat are these posing individually on birds and especially sensitive birds like brown dippers and ibis bill are which are river obligate and cannot live in any other kind of ecosystems and when we look at the world scenario dams are the major threat to maximum number of river birds this is a this i've compiled this from iucn this is a literature review that i was doing for my uh, thesis and so we see that more than 16 uh, almost 16 species of uh, river birds are being affected by dams and water management programs and the cultivation of annual and non timber crops along rivers where you remove the riparian uh, native vegetation affects most 
riverbeds. Human activities in the form of sand mining is another very big challenge, especially in the Indian scenario about which Parveen has also talked. There are some birds which have been trapped and hunted for eating, but then uh, not many that I'm aware of as in, in the Indian scenario. And logging and wood harvesting, which is also again impacting the riparian vegetation. Recreational activities in uh, terms of, so people do a lot of camping along these pristine riverbeds. Uh, people have water sports in these uh, fast flowing rivers. There are all sorts of uh, recreational activities these days down south also there are a lot of uh, different sorts of activities. And a lot of uh, introduction of invasive species which alters the food web ultimately and thus affects top predators like riverbirds. These are the major threats that are there to riverbirds all across the world. And if you look at the dam density all across the world, you will see hardly there are ma any major uh, part of the world which are not, you know, which are human habitat but are, have not been dammed. And if you look at the global distribution of free flowing rivers, according to the recently published WWF Living Planet Report, and if you look at India's condition, we are in a very, very bad position. And all across the Himalaya, about whose birds I was speaking all this while, you see there are not much of free flowing rivers, which is such an essential characteristic for the macro river macroinvertebrates, which form the primary you know, base the, of the food web of the entire stream ecosystem on which birds inevitably feed. And there are also others like fishes who depend on macroinvertebrates totally for their survival. And across the world, three most uh, threatened river birds are the Brazilian Marganser. It's only two, around 250 individuals that are left in the wild. And the Javan Blue Banded Kingfisher. The Javan Blue Banded Kingfisher is uh, not much is known about the species yet. There's hardly any research on this species yet. And one species where, whose geographic range is here also in India, the white-bellied heron. Work has started, research has started uh, on this species in our country, uh, in parts of Arunachal Pradesh. It's a fantastic bird, again, extremely elusive, like the ibis bill. You have to really do days of field work to get the sighting of one bird. But they're very, very unique, and not much is yet known about its ecology, and it's already critically endangered. And we don't really have much time, given the number of threats and the intensity at which they are increasing in such a populated country as India, it's high time that we act. White-bellied herons, uh, has, have, they have received some amount of uh, conservation uh, thing in uh, Bhutan. They have some uh, captive breeding programs also, same for Brazilian margansas. But the Java and blue-banded kingfisher, not much is yet known and the major threat to them until uh, whatever is known till now is removal of uh, riparian forest. As for the Brasilia marganser and white-bellied heron, a lot of uh, threats like uh, removal of riparian vegetation, damming of water, a lot of uh, introduction of alien species into river systems are major threats that are causing their decline. And in the Indian context, uh, about which Parveen had already spoken, the Indian skimmer, the black-bellied tern, are the most important birds which need uh, to be saved right away. We don't really have much time. And I would end on this note, the WWF Living Planet Report just pointed out that we have lost our freshwater species to an alarming rate, a rate which is unprecedented and cannot be stopped. And this curve cannot go up unless there is a global concern about freshwater ecosystems. We have protected areas for terrestrial systems, for marine systems. There aren't really any policies existing in India where we can save rivers and river dependent animals. And it is really saddening to people like us who work in freshwaters to lose these charismatic species forever. And with that, I would like to thank all of you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Anuja. Uh, thank you, Ankita. It's Gopa Kumar here. Uh, are Hello, you able sir. to? Yes. Yeah. Hi. And uh, that was a marvelous presentation. I think it brought out both the the beauty of river birds, and you highlighted this lovely point about 
the focus that they've built around song rather than on for example plumage and color that was that's so marvelous and and as you went through um i think we all got a sense of exactly the nature and the the scale of the threats that these birds are under um just a related point which is that uh, you you mentioned about the absence of protection for fresh water in general in india um it's also fascinating that there is really no policy in the country on yes. protecting riparian buffers as well and riparian yes. these stretches of riparian forest which are so critical for for these birds so thank you very much that was very very illuminating and you sort of very crisply and succinctly brought out so many aspects of conservation immediate conservation importance and i can see that you have a soft corner for the ibis bill yes, <clears throat> clearly yeah, yeah so yes i can see that that is very high yeah, i started you. work after i came across that word i decided to do my phd on river birds after i stumbled on them and it was accidental yes. but then yeah that was the turning point in my career wow okay and i have just as a, a on a personal note i have seen them um in the jay bhurali river in nameri as well and i think that's uh, really beautiful to see this so beautiful birds yes. Right? yes yes yeah jay bhurali yes yes okay so let's get some questions out of the way and um uh, i think there's been a uh, there's a question to to you since you are there at the moment mm-hmm. right here ankita yeah, yeah. so uh, adesha wants to thank you very much and she says a generic question what aspects do you think can be explored on the effect of land use changes in the region i guess what she means by what aspects do you think can be explored is it um can something be done mm-hmm. on land use changes that could protect possibly um birds that form the crux of your presentation the red starts and you know the the ibis bills and the white bellied herons and so on so yeah over to you probably it's yeah. a question more to do with what can be done to protect them yes okay so uh, ideally uh, there are three important things uh, so actually anuja told me that you know the, there might be a lot of people who are not from the science background so i tried to keep away all uh, you know the statistics and scientific figures so basically from uh, the scientific understanding most of the birds they need free flowing rivers so there are three important things first thing is free flowing river the second is uh, perch site so which which are these exposed bedrocks and riparian vegetation and the third thing is the riparian vegetation itself which provides a l- a very very important part in the life cycle of all the himalayan birds because it provides allochthonous input which is a subsidy to the food chain in the uh, in the river system and apart from that it provides shade so most of these birds uh, they have very fixed hunting uh, periods they don't uh, feed throughout the day so they they are active early in the morning and as the sun goes higher up they'll move into the riparian vegetation to uh, ro- they'll sit on rocks which are shaded they will not perch on uh, rocks which are directly under the sun they'll move away from the sun and they again come back only in the evening when the sun has faded away and also they you know these riparian vegetation provides them cover because they get hiding places they get nesting places they get their nesting material from these riparian vegetations so they they are absolutely very crucial and the flow of the river because that is the key parameter in any river system because that decides the microclimate of the riparian ecosystem uh, along with the temperature and uh, you know of the river the water of the river also the riparia the entire temperature system is being controlled by the flowing water so anything goes wrong affects the entire food web along with the breeding cycle of these birds which is dependent on also the water temperature so essentially very sensitive i would imagine that yes. the the yes yes thank you thank you very much for that and i'm also going to request both uh, parveen and uh, subhu to please unmute um so that we can uh, post questions to both of you as well right there's a there's a question to can i uh, uh, can i stop sharing uh, the yes yes please Green. yes uh. yes yes you could yeah 
So uh, there's a question to Subhu that I'm going to take, which is from Srinivas Sanantan, which is uh, among the wide variety of macroinvertebrate diversity, which taxa uh, are the most affected due to degradation of freshwater habitats? Um, which do you think are the most affected, uh, Subhu? If you could respond to that question. Okay, so as I already told you, so this uh, macroinvertebrates is a huge group. So, so, so in each taxa, let us take uh, crabs or mollusca or uh, dragonflies or any group you take. So there are sensitive taxa and uh, very resilient taxa, or we can say hardy species, which can tolerate a yes. limited level of pollution. So at the entire, like you might have heard about this uh, biomonitoring systems also. So the entire biomonitoring system is based on this philosophy that you look at taxa and see that there are sensitive species and there are uh, moderately tolerant to pollution and then there are uh, species which are highly tolerant to pollution. Yes. And so like for example, if you take our uh, common mosquito that is our uh, which bites in our home, that is a Culex species, they breed in drains. And there are mosquito species that require very highly pure kind of water, which breed in uh, tree holes or which a uh, very clear water. And so each species, or we, we could say that each species has a uh, requirement. So by just by right. looking at the uh, species composition or what we call it as community composition, you can assess the quality of water. So there are international protocols that is very well tested in Indian system also. So freshwater biomonitoring protocols where just by looking at you, you don't need to identify at species level but you can just identify at family level and you can say that okay this is the quality of water and even uh, there are like uh, you can just look at the like few uh, essentially it is ad advocated that you look at more number of taxa so that they respond to different kind of parameters of the water and then by looking at them you can see. so uh, we, we cannot say we cannot say which is most affected, or, right. but generally speaking, uh, the species which are especially hill streams are most affected by all these uh, either pollution or right. developmental activities. But the species which is found found in ponds, lakes, reservoirs, these are generally widespread species, and they have wide geographic range, and they are much more resilient. If you want to say, right? Uh, you want to say some kind of generality. If you want to say. And if you look at the endemism or evolutionary history and all those things, is the species which is found in streams, hill streams and rivers that is more uh, more endemic and more evolutionarily unique than what is found in the wetlands like coastal marshes or coastal. Right, right, right. Which is also a result, I guess, of co-evolution with the ecosystem as well. No, not no, no, not not like that. Now, if you look at the uh, geomorphology and uh, yes. Uh, the, uh, the distribution of these wetlands, you will see that the streams and uh, rivers are have much more uh, secluded. Like especially if you look at Himalayan streams, yes. each of the stream uh, stream or uh, river system is uh, disconnected from other neighboring rivers right. and streams. So they give a opportunity for evolution. But most yes. of these wetlands are very dynamic. There's especially wetlands in the uh, plains are dynamic mm -hmm. and they change over the time. And they are much more interconnected. Like if you look at the evolutionary history of several of these wetlands, and they change over time. And some of these wetlands were man-made; they were not natural. And and if you, even if you look at the like, for example, if you look at the migratory birds, and they like like you will see less uh, endemism or less um, like they are most more wide, geographically widespread because they usually use through a coastal route and where the wetlands are also there. So they have a, a geographic continuity. So most of these uh, birds, what you see in the uh, migratory birds or the wetland birds are have less endemism when you compare to forest birds or which are having. Okay. Thank so, you. So it is, is Thank you very much. I think that Thank is you. very, Thank very, very illuminating to hear. Um, I'm, I'm going to, you know, flip to Parveen and uh, there's a question once again from Srinivas, and it's a question that intrigued me as well. I had the same question, and that's why I'm sort of going to give it slightly unfair advantage. Um, uh, uh, there are three threats you identified, Parveen, and uh, one was feral dogs, clearly. One was the trampling by cattle, and then there was sand mining. And what Srinivas has asked you to do is really at some form to rank them. And to say, you know, which in your view is really the, is there a dominant threat among the three or are they sort of 
working in some kind of kind of unison or you would give them a sort of equal rating yes over to you and could you unmute yourself uh, so the thing is like we had monitored almost more than 200 uh, nest of river and birds and uh, feral dogs was contributing highest to the loss so almost 20 to 25 percent of eggs were predated by free ranging dogs and uh, uh, 22% of chicks were actually uh, predated by free ranging dogs so free ranging dogs were contributing maximum to the loss of all this river and nesting birds uh, so cattle sampling uh, had uh, was a second one and sand mining was a third one so uh, but yes. i would just like to point it out that sand mining when we see as a direct threat it might be contributing very less so but if you see on a large scale on a long term thing because if there is a there is an excess sand extraction that is on a long term going to harm this sand island formation because there is an you know the sediment that is coming in the river there is more sediment getting extracted every year so that is going to change this island formation on a long term wise and there will be very less of habitat available for this birds to nest so if i see on a long term basis sand mining is really a bigger threat yes. and uh, if i see it as a direct threat then i uh, we uh, we have got the results that free ranging dogs were majorly contributing to the la- loss happening in the okay. nesting success yeah okay okay thank you yes and i can sort of uh, completely resonate with exactly what you said thank you very much right um uh, swapnil has a general question to the three of you which is uh, is there any habitat restoration projects that you know of being carried out anywhere in india um it's a it's a question that is uh, open i guess to anyone so would anyone know of um habitat restoration in fresh water in the areas that you are working on um being carried out anywhere in india you mean not, uh, river and on the river and in the himalayas yeah yes i sorry anyone wants to go would parveen want to go first yes and then yeah, i'll come to subhu i would say that uh, in the plains that i work uh, i have not come across any come of across. the restoration like there might be some conservation intervention but not restoration yes. as it's happening on any of, of the river system that i right uh, subhu yeah so i will just to supplement regarding threats like uh, most of us would have seen or even have bought some nice pebbles for aquarium or for the lawns but if you look at from where these stones like round stones come if you look at the like An- ankita showed a uh, one picture of jcb in the stream but that may be due to some other thing but i have seen in most of himachal pradesh or even in other parts of arunachal pradesh there's a huge amount of unlike sand mining there is also a huge amount of this stone mining happening in rivers yes. and pebbles and other things so these are mostly breach then it is come to the market so that kind of one awareness we have to create especially in urban areas where these lawns and other things hotels and malls you can see these nice white stones they all mostly comes from the rivers and streams so there is a silent killing of the streams happening because of this kind of mining that is right. one aspect another aspect i want to talk about the restoration so the river and restoration i talk about because there are several examples of Uh, restoration of wetlands and ponds and lakes the uh, if you look at the uh, riverine system is a, a river is not in isolation it's a part of the landscape and entire river system is the lowest point in the landscape so it is the whatever happens to the landscape it ultimately comes to the river in any river system you see that is the lowest point in any landscape and whatever happens so it's it's so entire basin the entire catchment of the river is uh, is what we have to treat it for any conservation action so uh, there are examples where the rivers have rejuvenated by very good um, uh, action on the landscape so one is uh, that there is a nice project in atapadi in kerala for like this but this takes very long time to you see the result if you want to see the result of this happening so where streams have rejuvenated because of the actions on the land like we have a vegetation cover has come up and it is not actually the people are not worked on the rivers and stream as such but rivers are rejuvenated because of the work on the very good conservation action on the land so any uh, river and uh, restoration or any uh, river and uh, uh, restoration or any conservation action on the river you have to do you have to start from the uh, surrounding landscape riparian zone is very right. important and one of the major threat 
what uh, riverine ecosystems face today is the uh, destruction of riparian habitat so there are several species so i didn't talk about it but there are several species of plants specialized to live on the rip riparian ecosystem several tree species so, yes and riparian corridors right? i think that also yes. we will talk about so yeah. riparian corridors are very important for the movement of animals not just yes. the invertebrates but several large animals use this as highways in landscape so especially yes. to have a protect and also they are breeding grounds for several species of reptiles amphibians and other things and riparian zone just because of its um, unique uh, nature and unique habitat that forms a refugia especially in summer season when there is a, a moisture soil moisture is lost in forest floor so in the riparian zone the soil moisture is still retained and several species congregate not just the aquatic species but also yes. terrestrial species congregate so the conservation of riparian zone is very important and what happens sadly in india is that the protection of rivers and streams outside forest boundary so when the river and stream is within forest boundary it is a forest land so as soon as the river and stream leaves outside forest boundary it is a revenue land okay. and right. there is protection is not at all assured so there are very few rivers this one river i can definitely say like one is aganashini river in uttarakhand yes. yes. where you have forest up to the coast where you have very good forest and you can see the difference in the rivers yes so unless you have a very good riparian zone along entire stretch either it could be a very good forest or even a semi used like you can people can use it or some kind of protection regime then only you have uh, rivers and streams yes. and another aspect we have to understand that there is a lot of global studies also there is also a flood plain river interaction so what we call it as flood is actually a part of the ecology of the river where lot of nutrient dynamics happens and lot of uh, like uh, you like a lot of nutrient dynamics also and several species of uh, fishes and other organisms use this flood plain river interaction for completing their life cycle so what we call it as right. flood control is is in one way is also kind of uh, interfering with river ecology so right. there's a river flood plain interaction and there are several things which we are still unaware of several several aspects of river ecology Wow! Yes, and thank you so much. Yes, I I, I think I can. Uh, and you were talking about Agnashini, one very interesting element of the uh, the state, the positive sort of state of the river is the fact that community action has been very vibrant along that river. Yeah, yeah. I think there's very yeah. aware uh, set of villages and communities that have taken steps to protect. and conserve the river so that's um, thank you for that i i'm going to take one final question to ankita um and that uh, primarily because of lack of time there are two three more questions but we'll take this um ankita once again we are going back to conservation of birds and the the question is by archie and it's there seems to be no existing policies for protection of these birds right now can something be done to get attention to this issue so really it is what do we need to do um as if i may interpret what archi is saying what can we do as let's say um as common citizens as people who are scientists to get attention to this issue particularly because you've really talked about the most unusual birds possible yeah so over to you yeah so uh, what uh, dr subramaniam just rightly pointed out i've uh, i visited different himalayan states and there's only one river which was which i have visited which was flowing through a protected area the teethan river in the greater himalayan national park and uh, the river bhagirathi where i did my phd uh, field work for i've been working there for the last 6 7 years uh, so during the breeding season birds defend territories uh, and the number of territories that i have here in bhagirathi is half in i am my sampling units for 500 meters of river stretches and uh, every 500 meters had probably two uh, uh, territories for river uh, red starts and one for uh, dippers when i went to teethan i was amazed because the number and also the clutch size it goes it's so different teethan has so many uh, the clutch size is much higher so plumbius water red start their highest clutch size is 6 and all the nests had six i had i i could find seven such 
uh, parents with six fledglings. I was amazed. I had never come across that in the last uh, seven years of my field work, which is only two here in the Bhagirathi. And Tirthan is a beautiful, pristine river. There is uh, the, the buffer zone has some human settlements, but very less of it. And only some orchards along uh, the river, but majorly very, very pristine and <clears throat> all up till its source, which is almost, and the trek is all along the river, beautiful uh, uh, forests along the river. So what, what I feel is currently there are few birds which are small in size and have smaller territories. And they could do well because if we look at the length of him, the rivers that are available for, to them for feeding and breeding is still all right. But for the bigger birds which have longer territories and long or areas that they defend for breeding, like the white-bellied heron, like the skimmer, like uh, river terns, the, both the black-bellied tern, the river tern, and ibis bills, they, they defend larger territories, the requirements are more. So they need more land. And when the body size goes up, your dietary requirements go up and automatically you need bigger stretches of rivers to raise your next clutch. And these, that is why these are the birds. I did not show the results even across the globe, the birds which are the most big in size, except for the Javan blue banded kingfishers, they are the ones who are the most threatened. So what it's telling us is all these bigger bodied birds and most of them not really studied very well in the Indian context. I mean, thanks to Parveen, she works in Chambal, which is uh, like the hotspot for almost five to six uh, threatened river birds of the country. But, and probably also Chambal is the only part in the plains of India, which has a bit of protection, partially protected, but there's nowhere else in India where there's protection. What we can do on our part is first raise the conservation profile of these birds by making people aware about not only birds, all other river organisms which need pristine rivers and pristine river banks. We have multiple needs. We've been depending on rivers. We cannot suddenly stop depending on rivers. That cannot happen. And the government cannot suddenly make policies thinking about two birds, one river dolphin or some otters. Because rivers are essentially a part of human civilization and for years now. So that cannot happen. What can happen is what is still left with us, the conservation profile of that can be raised and people can change the ways of their living. In developed countries, uh, small birds which are not even threatened, least concerned birds like white-throated dipper and grey wagtail are used as indicators of river habitat quality. Uh, my supervisor, uh, Steve Ormerod, who's a river bird specialist all across the world, he's worked on dippers for the last 27 years of his life. And he has this book called The Dippers, where he writes about all the three species of, sorry, the five species of dippers. And there he constantly keeps pointing out that dippers are sentinels of rivers. They can tell you if a riverine stretch is healthy or not. If we have an animal which can tell us about the riparian health, why not protect that animal? and allow us to, you know, uh, to tell us how our rivers are proceeding, how our river is doing in terms of its health. Because we fall ill as humans, we have symptoms. The river shows symptoms too. When a dipper disappears from a riverine stretch, it tells us that the, dip the river is not doing well, at least for temperate systems. And that is true for all across the world, wherever dippers are found. And this is true for same for ibis bills and white-bellied herons because white-bellied herons, there's a group uh, in NCF, uh, Rohit uh, works on white-bellied herons. And we've had chats about this and Rohit tells me that they had to walk for kilometers to get the sight of one white-bellied heron and they could only find one nest and even that they were not sure. And the birds, once they detect that there are humans along any particular stretch, the birds don't really come back. They are that shy. So when we know there are such birds and they are already critically endangered and something going wrong, especially dams, because that is one thing we can probably stop. We have enough dams across the country and we have sources of green power, alternative sources of green power available in this large country. So wherever it's possible, we can stop dams. And, you know, it's just not birds. Mm. It's a, the entire river food cycle that gets protected when the river is flowing free and the banks are doing all right. So I think 
on our part if we are working in corporate sectors we can choose you know uh, our st- lifestyles because ultimately small decisions that we take in our everyday life has footprints on rivers and the land al- along them so yeah that i think that is what we can do raising the conservation profile making more people aware that yeah. rivers are just not for humans it's also for a lot of other organisms about which hardly anyone knows apart from the scientific community thank you that's a marvelous answer very evocative thank you so much right thank you i really loved hearing you uh, uh, parveen would you like to just add a comment or two and then we'll close for the evening yes so uh, i w- i would just like to say what ankita said you know she was talking about uh, you know how we are so much connected with the river it's it's when even i talk about sand mining and people you know people just think that sand mining should be stopped but if you talk to sand miners that's the easiest source for them uh, you know there is no employment in this region for people that's the reason that they are dependent on the sand as an easy source uh, a single tractor if you do one round gives a 3000 rupees so there is it's a free resource for earning and it's not actually locals which are responsible for this mining there are people coming from all this major urban cities to chambal to extract sand so there are tractors which are coming all the way from gwalior which come to chambal drive and take the tractors of sand and go out during this lockdown especially during the covid situation we thought that the pressure will be less but the number of tractors that extracted sand was 10 times in the covid lockdown so and this is so politically driven thing that you know we researchers talking about sand mining is not going to stop because there is such a loose policy about sand mining first thing so and we can't blame that sand mining shouldn't be done every of our house is constructed using this sand. that's right yeah so that's when right. people sitting sitting in urban cities and blaming the sand miners is not the correct thing as she mentioned that you know we have to think about a lifestyle obviously i'm not here to give a lecture that people should not use sand in their construction and there has to be an alternative or anything like that we have not reached up to that it's a thing that uh, there is need of an alternative livelihood to this people and That's you right. know we need to we need to really all people working on river conservation need to think about uh, need to really think about where our policies are heading to when i talk about chambal there are dams but these dams are not hydroelectric dams these are all lift irrigation dams which are there and it's it's a tri state river you know so when there is a project which is clearance from rajasthan madhya pradesh demands that why the water is going to rajasthan and why it's not coming to madhya pradesh so this is how that we have reached at a place where there are states there are districts fighting over water so there your lifestyle comes in picture that you use water since early because yes. i have seen in this landscape people staying next to river are not having water supply they have to go all the way to the river they have to come across you know there is there is a conflict between crocodiles and people because people use this this river systems for their daily needs so it's a it's the yes. system like you know sitting on the side of the system and talking about it's very easy but when i am at chambal i don't feel a, i feel that sand mining is the wrong thing but when you see people who are doing it uh, like locals extracting it that's a source of money for them that's a easy source of money for them you know there is there is a fishing ban in the sanctuary but locals staying are dependent on it so there is where our policy should not be so stringent and we shouldn't have a policy which is you know which is which is just common for the entire country it has to be taken consideration of the every river system which exists and local nuances yes and, yeah yes, yeah yes. yeah because you Thank are you. not there are there is no water supply to people and there will be always a demand for it and there will be a, you know it, the, it's an irony that you know the bharatpur sanctuary is getting water from chambal so it's like we benefited one sanctuary at the cost of another sanctuary so this is how our policies are you know taking place this is how clearances have been given out and scientists speaking is not enough and i think so this is where people come in picture and people should be aware about what is water crisis and what is happening to the river so that they can speak about it and they thank can you. they can stand along along with scientists yeah thank you thank you so much and that's a that's a really important note on which to call it a day to say that every one of us has a responsibility let's not yeah. just handle it or hand it over to the scientists and say you sort this out right every one of us has a role to play i just want to start to end by saying uh, three lovely conversations today beautiful conversations there's a lot to learn and take away 
So a very special thank you to Subhu, thank you to Parveen, and a thank you to Ankita. Right. Thank and uh, on that note, hope to be in touch with you. And uh, we will come up with another one probably in a few days from, from now, hopefully on fish migration day. So thank you very much and look forward to seeing you hopefully on the 24th of October. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. That's such a lovely conversation. Thank you.